Good afternoon, everybody. Um, at TED yesterday, I talked about uh, how all the projects that we do uh, at Universal Architecture come into being by asking questions. And after asking questions, of course, answering them and, and doing a discovery. Today, I want to uh, go into depth a little bit more to explain how you actually come from uh, asking a question to doing the discovery and, and see how you can make a project uh, really work. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Landscape House, and it started in 2009, where we uh, entered a competition in Ireland, which uh, had a very beautiful location. And we thought, let's not make uh, traditional housing, which would interrupt the landscape. So we asked the question, can you build like the landscape? Can we celebrate the landscape? And of course, when you ask a question like that, um, you have to see what the essence of landscape is. Zooming out on landscape, uh, the borders dissolve. As you saw in the previous picture, you have land, uh, water, but zooming out, of course, you see planet Earth. And planet Earth doesn't have a beginning or an ending. It's, it's a round circular shape. So we thought if we can uh, take it um, to the building level, we start with a piece of paper, uh, start folding it, and maybe make the suggestion of a floor, which also has uh, the quality of infinity in itself. This is called a Möbius strip. It's, of course, not our invention. It's by, uh, discovered by a German in the 19th century. But the interesting thing about this uh, infinity loop is that this piece of paper only has one side. Um, if you would color one, one side of a strip of paper green and the other side red, um, that's how we know uh, a strip of paper. But with the Möbius strip, you can only have one color. Um, from there, the suggestion of the floor was made, but of course you don't have space yet. So if you want to take it to the building level, uh, we needed to double the Möbius strip to actually have a suggestion of both a floor and a ceiling. So here you're looking at a, um, not a paper, but a, a leaden model, which has uh, the quality of space. And of course you can, you can fold lead because it has a stiffness and a softness. And we now saw the suggestion of an actual building. And I must say, we lost the competition um, uh, in Ireland, but the, uh, the question and the answer were quite interesting. So we thought, OK, let's develop this idea further and see if we can actually uh, continue with it. And at this moment, um, I, I discovered that I had my limitations. To draw this building, actually, uh, in, a, in a computer model or actually make it uh, function as a true building, um, the skills I learned in Delft uh, as an architect weren't sufficient enough. So I remembered an article in NRC Handelsblad um, five years ago. This guy, Rinus Rulofs, a mathematician and artist, became um, quite well known for discovering a mistake in uh, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. Here you see the drawing. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci made drawings for school books in his time. And um, he, he did it all by his head. But this guy, Rinus Rulof, discovered that this little pyramid on the bottom, it has four legs in the drawing, but that's impossible. It has to have uh, three legs. Something we don't see, but this guy discovered it by molding uh, all his drawings into the computer. He helped us with the landscape house. He was very enthusiastic. And this is the first time I learned about parametric design. Um, all the elements of the building, whether it be the thickness of the ceiling, uh, the inclination of the stairs, the width of the building, are connected, as opposed to traditional building where this wall is not connected to that wall. You can uh, thicken that one without thickening that one. But in this building, everything is connected. So you have slides which actually uh, mold it digitally, and um, out of that came this shape that was the next level after the, um, the leaden model. And in the, in the model we said, okay, we want um, a simple facade. We don't want to have double curved layers. So the result of that was that you get um, very complex curved uh, floor and ceiling. This was the first time that we used 3D printing. 
Um, this is a, a model about this big, uh, made of potato flour. And the interesting thing is that for the first time, from bottom to top, you couldn't see where it started or ended, which of course was relating to the, uh, the question for the project quite elegantly. Um, and at this moment, of course, as an architect, you make, you make a rendering and, and see what it might look like as a building and what, what the good things are and what are, are the problems still to be solved. It's good to, to point out that here, if you follow the, uh, the ceiling with your eyes, you turn into the, the floor, back into the ceiling, and it's, uh, it's one loop, so the floor is the ceiling. Um, so we succeeded in actually making this infinity, but there are a few problems still to be solved. One, of course, was uh, how do you get around in an, in an infinite building? Uh, there's one very simple stair, um, stairs, but in the corners you go from one floor to the next, and we didn't want to make an uh, autonomous stair like in a regular building. We wanted to, to go with the flow and, and rise up with one floor and step on to the next level. Um, so we succeeded almost in a, I would say, Escher kind of way. Found a great partner to actually execute this, uh, these stairs as well. And the other problem to be solved was the, um, the landscape itself. Because if, if you have the building, which is continuous, like the landscape, of course, you want to, uh, don't want to interrupt the landscape itself. So the entrance had to be underneath uh, and ha have to have a good flow of the landscape itself. Some more drawings where you see that also uh, from above, the landscape would go uh, through the building. You have, you'd, you'd still have separate rooms or, or uh, atmospheres within the building, although it would be one continuous uh, internal loop. You would still have six different areas where you can go. And again, we made a print, uh, 3D print, but now everything was solved. So the stairs are in there, uh, the entrance of the um, um, building is underneath it. Uh, again, potato flower print. And this is a very important step, because the, uh, Rinus Rulofs, the, um, the mathematician, is an artist who also worked with uh, an Italian uh, robotic engineer, um, Enrico Dini. You see him here on the right. And this guy uh, developed a 3D printer, uh, six by six meters. And Rinus Rulofs said, let's, let's take your building to the next level. Let's see if we can, can really uh, print it out uh, the way you envisioned it. Um, and when I heard he was uh, helping the people of the Sagrada Familia uh, print these enormous complex shapes, I thought, okay, this, this printing technique is uh, surpassing the, uh, the gimmick stage. Um, so we contacted uh, Rinus Rulofs as well, and he was very enthusiastic. We teamed up the three of us together with, Rin with Rinus Rulofs. And his machine is very um, simple in a way. It works as an inkjet printer, where an inkjet printer for 2D uh, images actually drops ink on top of a piece of paper. Uh, this guy drops magnesium chloride, which is a liquid, on top of a piece, uh, sheet of sand. And um, this is what, what the machine looks like uh, when it's outside. It's a very simple structure. And as you saw, the, the nozzles, it's hundreds of nozzles uh, apart from each other, five millimeters apart. The sheet of sand is five millimeters thick, and, and it will drop every five millimeters, uh, which will um, leave a voxel um, size of five by five by five millimeters. Here you see a, a test by the University of Trieste in, in Italy. They, they recently tested it positive as a building material. Uh, for all sorts of uh, uh, areas, impregnation, compression. Um, so that's, that's like a present when you work on a project like this, that you can actually uh, go on and use the material f for actually making the building. And this is one of the art pieces by Rinus Rulofs, also very much uh, like an Escher shape. It's one surface. And you see a roughness in the material, which is the result of... Uh, the, uh, the voxel density, and a voxel is what I just told you, the 5 by 5 by 5 millimeters, which derives from volume and, and pixel, of course. It's the, 
the spacious uh, pixel. It's good to, to point out a little bit how we relate to other printing initiatives. This is in China, where they use the uh, contour crafting technique to um, print out houses, at least the uh, walls. And it's a very interesting technique, but it's not the one we use, because uh, for this very complex building, we want to make uh, double curved layers and have complete freedom of form. And with this contour crafting technique, you would still have to push or put material on the previous layer. But impressive, it, it surely is. And this is one, one image uh, of 100 years ago um, in the area where I live, in Amsterdam, Betondorp, where they uh, actually built uh, houses with concrete for the first time. And it's interesting to point out that 3D printing is, is a revolutionary technique, but it's also very much relating to um, building with concrete 100 years ago. You have the same questions. Do you build with smaller, dry pieces? Do you, do you pour out... Uh, or do you pour concrete within a mold, like the, um, yeah, the wet technique that you just saw from the Chinese? Just uh, to relate it a little bit to uh, regular um, construction techniques. And then, of course, there were still a few steps to be taken. One was construction. Everybody was asking, okay, how are you going to make this? How are you going to keep it up? So we... Um, we approached Arab engineers, a very large uh, construction company, and um, again, enthusiasm, and they actually approached the building on a, on a very traditional way. They uh, said, let's, let's see if we can uh, make um, a traditional steel and glass construction uh, so that the printing is really used for the free form that you, uh, that you envision which led to uh, several drawings and diagrams. Uh, this is one of them. This is the first time, actually, I discovered that the facade is also a Möbius strip. So it also has just one side. Um, front is also back. So the landscape house is pretty much two Möbius strips uh, uh, to put together. And here you see one of the schemes that we uh, uh, drew to, to at least show partners that we could build it. A combination of traditional techniques, uh, separations for insulation, uh, electricity, construction, and the 3D printed parts for uh, complete freedom. Uh, Time magazine is always nice, um, um, but it's also important to publish uh, one's idea, your idea when you really want to, at least when, you're, uh, when you develop the idea uh, up to a good point where it's actually feasible. Um, it was very interesting to, to go public and see how the, the idea and the building itself traveled. Um, but it's also an important, it has been an important step to, to find the right partners to actually um, get this uh, project uh, into realization. Um, another important part is that we designed this building as a house in the beginning because it was for a competition where they asked us to uh, design houses. But once we, we further developed the uh, 3D printing technique, um, um, we related it to uh, a new way of making. And it's a nice image here by, uh, you see the thinker by Rodin, uh, the sculptor who said, I take away what I don't need. And in 3D printing, of course, you make what you do need. So you don't make any molds or uh, it's the direct way of production that made us uh, coin this building as, a, as an expo space. And also, um, with an expo space for art, you can, we can keep the transparency and the quality of the building intact, instead of with a house. Um, people might close it up, or uh, for companies as well, they might put little offices in it, which uh, would uh, not help the design, so to say. And very important is that um, with those uh, uh, developments and publication and, and everything, we found uh, some very strong partners. And I know it's not... Uh, uh, it, usually you don't show any uh, companies at TED, but um, it's, it's important to say that for every part of the, uh, the project, we found strong partners. Uh, BAM as a builder, um, AM developing, and TU Delft, for example, for the glass construction. 
Eastairs, as I said before. So all these, all these companies have their specialty, um, which they bring in to make this uh, uh, into a success. We had a forum uh, a few weeks ago, and it's, of course it's nice when you start something on your own and it becomes a team effort. We had a, uh, next to some speakers on the forum, we also had a workshop. Uh, and here you see Martin van Hecke, he's, he's professor uh, in experimental physics in Leiden, and he discovered, for example, that uh, the structure of a material is more important than what the material is made of. It sounds weird, but um, he says the way holes are made in materials is more important for its strength than, like I said, what it's made of. And the skill of this structure doesn't even matter. So it's an amazing uh, guy to have on our team as well. And Arab Engineers is uh, also printing steel nodes currently. So they, they made this, uh, this node of steel, which is um, very strong. They're currently testing it. And the results are uh, like, like normal steel. Um, so we want to take these um, workshop outcomes um, of course, into the next level of, of print, printing and, and using all these different techniques, not only the rock printing, but also the steel printing. So looking again what, from what we learned at one of these turns in the building, and, and I'm going to show you two more slides, but these are the last steps and, it, and it's changing every week. But um, where we stand now is actually uh, looking at, for example, the section of a floor uh, where, of course, if you make a span of seven meters, you, uh, you need steel, for example, where, where the tension is the biggest. And of course, you can do the rock printing for where the compression is the biggest. So here we are looking at um, uh, the section of the floor, and, and you can see different voxels. And uh, we aim to put the voxels at, at its right place, and, and only there where it's needed. And of course, you can, again, use the computer um, to calculate um, what are the best places so you, we can hopefully become very concise and precise in, in how we're going to uh, print this building. Um, the first thing you, uh, we're going to see or we're going to make is uh, hopefully end of this year, beginning next year, is um, a very small uh, bench, 2.4 by 2.4 by 2.4 meters, where we hopefully have the uh, techniques that I showed in the previous image. Uh, all combined, and um, the next step will be to print out um, one module of the building, and then finally, hopefully, BUM and AM are aiming at 2016 uh, to build the endless expo space in Amsterdam. But you know how it goes with uh, building projects. But we keep working on it, and I want to thank you for your time.